So cancer remains the second leading cause of death in the United States. And everyone in this room probably knows someone who has experienced or died from cancer. Well, at least I do. On January 31st of 2010, I lost my dear dad to prostate cancer. It was very painful for me to watch my once healthy, strong, and charismatic dad constantly battling for his life, and I always wished I could do more for him. My dad had a relatively poor outcome and only lived for three years after his diagnosis. During the years that I spent with him, I've always known him to live a very healthy life. There was no family history of cancer, and I knew he could afford the best healthcare treatment available. But even though the external odds seemed to be in his favor, just checking these boxes were not enough to help him, and he eventually passed on. And so this suggested to me that in addition to the many external and environmental factors that can dictate the outcome of cancers, there might also be some internal factors that can also dictate how your cancer outcome will be. And so I started this journey of a biochemistry research career to learn more about cancers so I can help other cancer patients to have better outcomes. So one of the earliest things I learned are that cancers are basically the body's version of overpopulation. So in healthy cells, the birth rate of new cells are closely matched with the death rate to maintain a healthy balance of cells. But in cancer cells, the birth rate of new cells far exceeds the death rate due to mutations in these cells. And so what you end up with is this overpopulation or mass of cells that we call tumors or cancers. Now for every cell, whether healthy or cancerous, a group of proteins, a group of molecules called proteins are the major workforce that drives the cell's growth and function. These proteins are to the cell like an engine to a car. Now for cancer cells, because they usually have to grow faster and more rapidly, their proteins tend to do a lot more work than usual. And this can put a lot of stress on the protein. And so over time, we expect the proteins to break down and die, but they don't. Instead, cancer cells make a lot of a special type of protein called heat shock proteins, or HSPs. These HSPs help all other proteins to recover from stress so that the cancer cell can stay alive and functional. And so you may be wondering, if this is the case, then can we stop HSPs? And if we do, will that help the cancer cells die like they're supposed to so that cancer patients can have better outcomes during treatment? Well, maybe, except things get a little bit tricky here because healthy cells also need HSPs for other stress conditions like fever. And so instead of completely knocking out HSPs, what we really need is to be able to control the activity such that there's just enough for normal stress conditions like fever, but not for cancers. But before we can even do that, we need to first take a step back and understand HSPs so we can use that knowledge to fine tune the activity. So as I mentioned, proteins are the major workforce of the cell, and each cell usually has thousands of proteins that perform different functions. Now an active or functional protein is called a folded protein, which basically means it has a very unique shape. So I usually like to think of a folded protein as being similar to a folded paper shape or origami. The fold determines the function. Now, when cells are exposed to stress, the proteins begin to break down and lose their shape. So they basically become like a crumpled paper that we call misfolded protein. These misfolded proteins are very sticky and start attaching themselves to each other to form these huge structures that we call protein aggregates. Protein aggregates are no longer functional and that is what leads to cell death. But of course, cancer cells won't die because they have HSPs to their rescue. So when a type of HSP called HSP90 is present, it is able to hold and separate the misfolded proteins from each other so that the aggregates no longer form. HSP90s then use a type of energy molecule called ATP to release the misfolded protein to another HSP called HSP70. HSP70 also uses the 
It also uses ATP to disentangle the misfolded protein, making it fully folded and then help the protein to fold back into the original shape. And so if we go back to the paper metaphor, HSPs take their crumpled paper, completely open it to make it back into the starting structure, and then now they can help it to fold into the unique shape. And so by helping to sort and refold misfolded proteins, HSPs help cells, especially cancer cells, to recover from stress. But as you can see from this schematic, both HSP90 and HSP70 require this energy source called ATP for their work. And so what we as a scientific community is trying to do now, and we are working so hard on this, is that we are trying to feed cells with molecules called inhibitors that look exactly like ATP but are actually dead. And so in any cell, what you can have is that some HSPs will bind to the actual ATP and be active whereas the majority will bind to the dead version or the inhibitors and will no longer be active. And so by doing this, we'll be able to control the level of activity of HSPs so that cancer cells can die like they're supposed to. And we are hoping that this will improve outcomes for cancer patients during treatment. And so hopefully from this talk, you can appreciate how much the scientific community is working hard to make sure that the internal odds are in favor of every cancer patient. And if you are wondering what you can do to help, well, we can all start by living a very healthy life, getting regular checks, and encouraging our loved ones to do so, so that together we can beat this monster called cancer. Thank you. <laughs>